you so much for the kind invitation and, and providing me this opportunity to share uh, actually certain parts of my upcoming book and, and, and with respect to the uh, economics of violence or economic ramification of the political violence uh, and, and, and uh, when we uh, think about violence, we usually collect the violence, mass violence, we usually focus on the physical aspect of physical violence, obliteration, destruction. But what I am going to be talking about is today also related to de harmonize de harmonization of the space and then transformation of space into, you know, another kind of entity for the perpetrators to capitalize on. And, and also, the economy, what I mean by, what I, what I am trying to refer the economy of, by economy of political violence, <coughs> or collective violence, as a policy instrument to solve an internal problem in the eyes of Ottoman ruling government at that time. So I'm trying to take you through Antep in order to substantiate this story, you know, of course, uh, within the Ottoman context. So we try to understand what collective violence means within the Ottoman context, within the imperial context this time. So much of the literature uh, on the destruction of Ottoman Armenians tells the story of a state captured by a radical party that enforced exterminatory measures throughout the land. Scholarship about genocidal activity at the local level, however, what social scientists might call the periphery, it's still in infancy. It's infancy. My aim here, therefore, is to examine such activity on the Ottoman periphery, focusing on the district of Aintab, or Antep, modern-day Gaziantep, where I was born and raised. So, so Antep, uh, basically, so it was located in Aleppo province, 55 kilometers west of the Euphrates and 45 kilometers to the north of the modern Turkish Syrian border. Uh, and and, and, uh, and Aintab in 1914 had an Armenian population that probably numbered somewhere between 30,000 and 37,000 people. It's estimated that the number of Armenians deported from Aintab was approximately 32,000. So drawing upon primary sources from Ottoman, Armenian, British, French archives, as well as from memoirs and personal papers, I will first examine the persistent e efforts of some of the Aintab's most prominent citizens to get the central government to expel the district's Armenians, demands that seem to be have enjoyed a locally considerable level of social support. Yet for some time, these demands encounter resistance from several powerful civil and military figures. The result was the Aintab's Armenians were deported later than most of their eastern neighbors in the western wilayats, so western Armenia, eastern wilayats in western Armenia. The second part of the argument focuses on the events after the genocide, so the post-war period. So we also, I will try to show you the formation and construction of the post-war Middle East as a result of the destruction of Armenians. And the successive British and French occupations of the district, the return to uh, Aintap or, or Aintap of Armenians who had managed to survive their efforts to recover their property, and then a second and final expulsion. Those in Aintap, now in the possession of Armenian property, no longer vulnerable to challenge, used their political power during the Republican era to consolidate their hold on these assets. So much of the physical capital of Aintap and its elites, Mütegallibe, local elites, provincial notables, were products of the Armenian genocide. So I highlight the crucial role played by the local elites and actors who prospered through the acquisition of Armenian property and wealth. In this respect, I argue that the Union and Progress Party, the, the then Ottoman ruling government, its genocide and deportation decision had a significant level of social support through the practice of effective power and control mechanisms at the local level. The sheer scale of actions constituting genocide could not be carried out with a single order from the central government. Therefore, peripheral dynamics play an extremely important role in this destruction. As Jan Gross, the, uh, the well-known Holocaust historian, eloquently remarks, the participation of local population is a necessary condition to ensure the effectiveness of genocidal policies. 
The CUP relied to a considerable extent on the cooperation of local administrations and political institutions and ordinary citizens, ordinary civilians in Antep. So not only did the actions of these, these, these Aintab society, let's say, fulfill the ideological requirements of the regime, but they brought material gain in the form of expropriated and they pillage our main properties. So we are talking about here the dual track mechanisms. On the one hand, there was a plunder. On the other hand, there was a so-called legal confiscation and, 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 uh, and depredation process on the basis of uh, numerous laws, regulations, and degrees. Thus, a reward mechanism was created by the CUP, which could draw political and social support for their decisions to deport and massacre Armenians. The profiter, profiteers justify their confiscation and seizure of Armenian wealth not as a robbery or plunder, but as fair reward for their participation in the elimination of harmful and treacherous elements. Beyond base greed, the fervor with which they executed the genocide on the local level must be understood in part as a result of the rationalization that they were acting in the service of the Ottoman state. So let's start with the deportation process as a social event, as a social process, political process, in order to understand the uh, 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 political climate in the city, you know, and like the spirit of the time at, at that time. So deportations of Aintab Armenians began in early August 1915, so quite late compared to the deportation in most eastern regions. The forced deportations actually they were taking place in Zeytun, Dörtyol, and Adana and Marash in April 1915, in cooperation with Triumvirat Jamal Enver and Talat Pasha. But Jamal was the leading factor who convinced Enver and Talat to deport these Armenians in those regions. But these deportations were based on not exterminatory mentality, but it was it was based on military and political concerns. The transition from strategic to genocidal deportations occurred during the one uprising on April 19, 1915. The large-scale deportations of 24th of April and 23rd of May signified an intensification of anti-Armenian measures. They were followed on 21st of June by orders for still wider sweeps. Aintab, however, had not yet become an area of displacement. In fact, in a coded telegram by Talat to Jamal Pasha regarding the deportations, its Armenians were not mentioned among those to be expelled from Aleppo province in Biladesham. Only at the end of July 1915 was Aintab included in the planned deportation scheme. So in late March 1915, Aleppo's provisional government, Jawabe, reported to Jamal Pasha that some Armenians living in Aintab's Muslim quarters were discreetly moving their belongings to the Armenian quarters. The news was creating great concern among the Muslim population who feared that Armenians were preparing to revolt. Jamal Pasha informed the Minister of Interior, which in response ordered Aleppo province to make the following announcement in Aintab on 29th of March. Quote, no Armenians shall be allowed uh, a change of a place. Those who have done so shall return to their prior neighborhood, unquote. But it added the reassuring promise that the properties, lives, and honor of the population loyal to the government shall be protected any, against any attacks, and the slightest assault by the Muslim population against any Armenian, even they were revolutionaries or rioters, shall be subject to immediate disciplinary action. As it turned out, Aintab's Armenians were eventually were deported, but only in August 1915, after much of the rest, Eastern Anatolia had already been cleansed. Why? Why were the Aintab's Armenians spared for so long? Adam Andonian, an Armenian journalist and intellectual who survived arrest and deportation in late April 1915 and found refugee in Aleppo, had immediately begun collecting information on the government's annihilation campaign that would continue to do so throughout the war. His files contain materials on Aintab that are invaluable source for the dynamics driving the fate of Armenians in the city. Andonian learned that as early as March 1915, the leaders of the Aintab CLUP club, led by Ali Jenani, here we go, the dis district parliamentary deputy, Fadel Bey, 
that the former district governor of Kilis and Haji Mustafa Bey, a prominent Kilis notable, began taking advantage of the incidents in Zeytun and Marash to depict their own Armenians as a harmful element. They repeatedly appealed to Istanbul, hoping to obtain a deportation order for the Armenians of Aintab and Kilis. They were thwarted, however, by Şükrü Bey, Aintab's district governor, and Hilmi Bey, Aintab's military commander, even though both men, as Armenian survivors noted in their memoirs, were themselves unionists. They were members of the CUP. The military commander simply informed the central government that there was no valid reason for deportation. Two other Armenians in the district, Kirikor Bogoryan and Sebo Aguni, confirmed Andonian's picture of Shukri Beis and Hilmi Beis' opposition to deportation. Undoubted by this official opposition, the three Aintaxi notables, with the assistance of their Marash counterpart, they organized a series of provocations. They also sent telegrams to central government claiming that Aintab Parmenians had attacked mosques with weapons, killed Muslims, raped Muslim women, burned down Muslim houses, plundered their property. Hilmi Bey responded by personally requesting that Jamal Pasha punish the notables as provocateurs. Although his opponents countered by branding Hilmi as an Armenian sympathizer. Aleppo's provisional governor Jalal Bey added his support for the commander by reporting that this situation was causing great panic among Arab Armenians. His investigation revealed an Armenian community that feared a general massacre, Umumi Qatar. In light of these charges and counter charges, Jamal Pasha dispatched the 4th Army 2nd in command, Fahri Pasha, to Aintab in April 1915 to investigate in person. Police searches of the Armenian neighborhoods failed to provide any confirmation of the acquisition of Deputy Ali Janani and his cronies. In fact, the Ar American consul in Aleppo, Jesse Jackson, noted that Fahri Pasha announced to Aintab's leading Muslims in the presence of Christians that, quote, if any Muslim frightened Christians or in any way treated them unkindly, he would himself hang him even if the offender were his own brother. Unquote. He himself behaved toward Christian leaders in Aintab in a very friendly manner. And this be actually this disposition of Ali Pasha was even corroborated by the Catholicos at the time, the Sahak the second. After Fahri Pasha left Aintab, however, situation burst. Ali Bey, a ranking member of the Teshkilat Mahsusa special organization and the bandit leader, was summoned by Ali Janani in late April, arriving in Aintab with a squadron of Chekhes bandits who began organizing, organized pillaging and murders outside the city. Then on April 13, 1915, the first raids inside the city took place. To obtain the weapons and harmful writings, so-called harmful writings, alleged to be hidden in Aintab, the houses of prominent Armenians, including Dashnak and Hunchak members, were raided. Nothing incriminated was found. Nevertheless, many Armenians were arrested. Another wave, another wave of house searches was conducted on May 1st, and then men were arrested and brought before the military court in Aleppo. In addition, 30 leading political figures from the Armenian community were sent to Aleppo for interrogation. And after questioning, 18 were returned to Aintab. Again, no incriminating evidence was found and all were set free. On May 12, house race and individual arrest of intellectuals peaked with the collective arrest of 200 people, but the provisional governor Jalal Bey helped release most of those apprehended. Some detainees were freed on the same day, others a few days later. Meanwhile, however, Aintab's Armenians became witness to the deportations of those from less fortunate reason, regions. As house raids and police search in Aintab continued on May 3rd, they saw the first convoy comprising 300 women and children from Zeytun pass through the city. The deportees had suffered greatly on their way. Some were injured, their wounds infected, and their clothes in tatters. Ms. Frierson, an American missionary worker, noted that Aintab Sarmanes managed to create a relief committee for the deportees. And John Merrill from the Central Turkey College and Dr. Hamilton and the nurses from the American hospital also made great efforts to aid the exiles, many of whom children included, were suffering from the serious knife wounds, and large convoys of 2,000 people followed. Indeed, throughout June and July 1915, convoys from Zeytun, Marash, Elbistan, Gürün, Sivas, and Fornus continued to fill the streets of Aintab on their way south towards Syria. All of them were in a similarly destitute conditions, having suffered 
continual attacks on their persons and property along the way. All the deportees were kept in Kavaklit neighborhood, 15 minutes from the city center, near a spring, where they had to pay gendarmeries a quarter of Mejidiye, the smallest denomination of Turkish currency, so one piaster equals to 15 fennings, for a glass of water. Eintop's Armenians bribed the gendarmeries and tried to supply the deportees with food and water themselves. Yet, while the Eintop, Eintopsies bore witness to these horrors, they did not consider the possibility that they may face a similar fate. Wahe Gülesaryan, who was there, described this state of mind as follows. In spite of everything that was happening around us, and in spite of all the facts standing in, in front of our eyes, the number of those who buried their head in the sand like an ostrich was not small. These people convinced themselves that they were happy, and they tried to deceive themselves into believing that a similar deportation was not possible for Aintab and nothing bad would happen to them. Unquote. So previously, Aintab Armenians had relied on the honesty and kindness of Jalal Pasha, Jalal Bey, Shukru Bey and Hilmi, the provincial and district governors of Aintab's military commander, to shield them from deportation. The period of wishful thinking ended when Jamal Bey, the general secretary of Aleppo's CUP branch, arrived in late June, accompanied by a few propagandists. The mission of the Unionist cadre was to convince Aintab's notables to repeat their entreaties to Istanbul to issue a deportation order. Jamal Bey succeeded in pressuring the local CUP and other Muslim leaders to send a new slanderous letters to the capital. On 21st June 1915, the German consul at Aleppo, Walter Rosler, reported that Governor Jalal Bey was to, was to be removed from his post because of his refusal to deport Armenians. Indeed, on June 13, in a reshuffle of provincial governorships, Bekir Sami Bey was given the Aleppo seat and while Jalal Bey was moved to Konya. On July 5th, Jalal left Aleppo. Aram Andanyan mourned his, mourned his departure, noting his, uh, his file regarding Aintab as follows. Aintab Turks, collaborating with unionists in Aleppo, succeeded in removing the honest, charitable and reasonable governor of Aleppo from his post." Unquote. Still. As late as July 17, Aintab's own district governor, Shukru Bey, was able to inform the Minister of Interior that no Armenian had been deported from Aintab. Dissatisfied with this state of affairs, Talat Pasha replaced Shukru with Ahmed Faik on 26th of July 1915. Around the same time, Hilmi Bey also resigned, and July 2019, the local CUP at, at last received a positive reply to its entreaties from the central government and Aintab was added to the deportation list. By the time Ahmed Faik Bey reached in Aintab on August 26, the deportations had already begun. So once they received the good news from Istanbul, local young Turks called an emergency meeting and prepared the list of Armenians to be deported. The very next day, Consul Rostar notified his superiors that the order to deport Armenians from Aintab and Kilis had been issued. On July 13th, 50 Armenian families were ordered to leave Aintab within the following 24 hours and the day of deportation began on August 1st, 1915. So, at first, only Orthodox Armenians were deported. So, we were talking about six convoys which were replete with Orthodox Armenians from Aintab and, and they were basically prominent and, and, and the wealthy families from the city, including, you know, other deportees. So according to instructions, this is Ali Jenani. According to instructions, each family was expected immediately to pack a few of their, their belongings. They would be allowed to take food, bedding, jars, clothes, and blankets. The testimony of Yervan Derens, a survivor from Aintab, vividly evokes this very first day of deportation. Quote, children, elders were all on the road. Our neighbors, the Turks, were singing from their homes. We could hear them. It yola bindi, it yola bindi, it yola bindi. The dog is on its way, the dog is on its way, the dog is on its way. Unquote. Even then, comforting, comforting rumors softened the blow. That his this exile was only for three or four months, that the deportees would be sent to places like Aleppo, Damascus, Hama, Homs, where life could continue, 
and that no one will be managing the convoys and that only individuals suspected of subversive political activities will be deported. So the first convoy consisting primarily of notable and affluent families such as Jevejians, Demirjians, Premians, Kabakians, Kürtçians and Leylekians along with the members of the Deportation Relief Committee left for Aleppo after which it continue on to Hama. Walking in a line, these deportees proceed to Akçakoyunlu, the railroad station closest to Aintab. So they were actually here sitting down and waiting for the train in Akçakoyunlu train station here, just surrounding. So as this convoy was making its way from the western side of Aintab, bands of 400 men led by Ali Bey, Yasin Bey and Hacı, Hacı Fazlızade Nuri set off from the east side intending to assault them in a nearby Sazgan village where deportees would spend the night. Ismail Bey, the nephew of Hajj Fazlazade, helped his uncle as chief of the bands. Hajj Hamza Bey and the local prefect of Sazgan village was chief of other bands. Fortunately, these bands departed later the first convoy and missed most of the deportees. However, they were able to catch Nazareth Manushagyan, a member of the municipal council, who fell behind the convoy and murdered him. So the second convoy was deported on August 7th, the third one the day after, and the fourth one August 11th, and the fifth one August 13th, and the sixth one 23rd of August. From Akçakoyunlu, the first two groups were sent to Damascus. The rest were held in a transit camp surrounded by barbed wire, or wire while waiting to be loaded in stock cars for transport to Aleppo. And these deportees were later sent on foot to the region of Derzor. Following the, uh, following the Orthodox Armenians, deportation of Catholic and Protestant Armenians were started. So, um, on September 29th, in Aintab, before the deportation, there were 75 Catholic families. After the deportation, there were none. 20 of them were located in Aleppo, 55 in Bab. The situation of the Catholic armies in Aleppo was fair, whereas in Bab it was miserable. But eventually, all Catholic armies from Aintab were sent to Derzor as well. So by late September 1915, three quarters of the Armenian population of Aintab had been deported. In early October, Ahmed Faik Bey and his allies organized raids on protestant houses and made numerous arrests. The process they had been witnessing eventually eroded Aintab protestant hopes, I mean protestant hopes that they would be spared the deportation suffered by the Orthodox and the Catholics. Yeah. House rates increased. All the coffee houses and other places where people congregated were shuttered and the curfew was imposed. I'm just trying to give you the sense of the reign of terror in the city, which was ongoing, you know, following the more than 20,000 people's deportation. Circumstances deteriorated further when Colonel Galip Bey, commander of a military reserve battalion from Urfa, arrived in Aintab on November 13. Galip Bey held certain Arme Armenians responsible for the resistance to deportation in Urfa that October and he aimed to use that event as a pretext to deport Aintab protestant Armenians. However, Draft Office President Yusuf Efendi, Military Commander Osman Bey, and Mayor Sheikh Mustafa objected to Galip Bey's plan. Despite this disagreement, on December 15, the officers registered the names of our Armenian protestants who will be deported. On December 19, the first convoy was sent again via Akçakoyunlu to Derzor. It was followed by 2nd, 3rd, and 4th convoys up to 23rd of December. By now, Aintab's protestants had ample time to learn what the deportation to their job <coughs> meant and did not hesitate to use every means, such as bribery, personal contacts, and other special social capital, to make sure that they would be deported via Homs, Hama, Domas Damascus Road instead. It was to no avail. On December 24th, it was announced that deportations will be suspended for the Christmas period until the New Year. They recommenced on January 4th, 1916, when the fifth convoy was sent away. So of 600 protestant families in Aintab, 200 were deported, the majority of 
whom were any highlighted in Derzor. In total, by January 1916, more than 20,000 Armenians were deported. So it's important to underscore that the deportation organized in Aintab were supervised by the deportation committee presided over by the district governor Ahmed Faik Bey. So the, in the, on the deportation committee, every branch of respectable Aintab society was represented. The district's parliamentary deputy and his brother, the head of the provincial cabinet and the local prefect, and a variety of municipal officials including the president of the municipality, its financial officers, including the head of its treasury, two officials in the tax department, and two secretaries in the finance department, a census officer, officer two judges, a magistrate, and the first secretary of the court. Law enforcement was also prominent, including two gendarmerie commanders, a sergeant in the gendarmerie, two police lieutenants, and a prison warden. The military was also there, including a regimental commander, a member of the general staff, a regimental secretary, and the commander of a gang, of 400, along with several religious leaders, former Mufti, two Imams, two Ulema, two Sheikhs, the secretary of a religious charity, a physician, a lawyer, the director of an orphanage, the director of the agricultural bank, local leaders of the CUP were also on its rolls. This list points to the breadth of social support that underpinned the regime's genocidal policies in Aintab. Perhaps more importantly, men, such as these legitimize the process of genocide. None of these local worthies did anything to stop the convoys, hide the vulnerable, or even protest against expropriations and deportations. Perhaps, more importantly, men such as these legitimize the process of genocide, made use of, you know, the all expropriation and deportation process. Many of them benefited enormously from the deportations. There were 6,000 residential homes and 7,000 parcels of land that belonged to Aintap Armenians. It's possible to divide seized land, landed properties into four categories. Major immovable properties of the wealthy families, middle or second class immovable assets, public properties, and national properties or properties owned by religious institutions. Families in the first category had numerous properties in and outside of Aintap including villages, farms, fruits, orchards, fields, vineyards, inns, coffee houses, houses, shops, and water mills. In the second category, people own relatively uh, smaller properties. And in the third category, there were 700 Armenian families. A hundred of these families did not own a house. They had landlords or live with other people. The remaining 600 families reside, resided in their homes, houses. Among them, there were also low-income families who possessed two or five orchards. The properties within the fourth category belonged to Armenian Orthodox Church, Surp Azvedesi and other churches. These included buildings surrounding these churches, 25 shops, two mills owned by Armenian Catholics and Protestants, the library, which bore the name of a Niziplian, a coffee house, the Millet Inn, as well as other, you know, Khans and Inns, and the buildings of the Vartanyan, Atenegan, along with six shops inside Nersesian, Haigazian, Haiganushian Seminary, and Giligia Jemaran schools. These are all schools. All these estates were transferred to aforementioned perpetrators through liquidation, expropriation, and confiscation. From the perspective of the overall process, the function of appropriation was an important, as important as the individual purposes. Huge numbers of people were bound together in a circle of profit that was at the same time a circle of complicity. Aintab Armenians had been exiled. So, in, as for the active participation of local elites in plunder, uh, who were motivated by the promise of acquiring mobile and immobile Armenian properties, local elites meticulously carried out sent orders sent by the unionists from the center of the government. To ensure the success of Armenian destruction, an executive committee was established with the encouragement of district governor Ahmed Faik and Ali Janani. Its members included local notables, local CUP members, and civil and military officers. These members were the son of Debba Kibyazade, local merchant and well known provincial elite Kadir, the son of a prominent local notable, a large, large land of the Nuri Bey, and the prison warden Zeki, the son of the gendarmerie commander Haji Halil, Seyyafzade Abdul Efendi, Nafi and Asaf, and Tahchizade Abdullah, 
Menanzade Mustafa and Ulema Bülbül Hoca. The committee selected four representatives and sent them to Derzor to see actual living conditions of Ainta Parmenians firsthand and to ensure that the circumstances rendered it impossible for them to return to Ainta. Having done so, they could seize our main properties without any reserve. These four representatives were the son of Debba Kimyazade, Kadir, the son of Nuri Bey, the son-in-law of Seyyafzade and Zeki, the son of Haji Halim. After confirming the dire situation of Ainta Parmenis in Derzor, committee members freely participated in auctions organized by the liquidation commissions. As they were close with Tevfik Bey, the president of Ainta Liquidation Commission, they were able to purchase valuable Armenian items at very low prices. So the very existence of this committee demonstrates that deportation, expropriation and extermination was a party policy that a dual track mechanism was in place. Alongside the government official channels, another special network dealt with the process of confiscation and seizure through the CUP. In other words, local actors close to the CUP club in Ainta were active agents of the process. Government officials could receive orders and implement them, but it was these local agents who personally went to Derzor, illustrating the degree of their involvement. They were all placed to reap the benefits of the situation. So what happened after the war? So, Aintab was first occupied by the British forces in December 1918, on the ground in the 1919, uh, on the grounds that they needed to procure food for the cavalry horses to ensure the security of their units in Aleppo, the British forces. The city itself was in dire situation, in dire straits. According to missionary reports, as a result of conscription and deportation, its population had dropped by 30,000 with the loss of labor and services that is implied. But in place of them, we have about 12,000 Muslim refugees, women and children who are entirely dependent on relief. Added to this, the very fact of the British occupation enraged the Muslim community who claimed that not a single event and then during the safety of returnees had occurred in Aintab and therefore the occupation was illegal. In early 1919, prominent figures from Aintab's branch of the CUP, men who had been active in deportation and dispossession of Armenians, knew that they would be targets of the occupier's justice. Who were they? Tahçizade Abdullah, Ketudazade Hüseyin Cemil Bey, Mamad Azade Ali Efendi, and the Kurt Hacı Osman and Hafız Şahin Efendi, who was still a parliamentary deputy, by the way, met together. Their object was to build a resistance front against the occupiers and provoke the Muslims to continue the struggle, but they failed. British troops were able to keep the lid on the situation while their commanders major Mills worked on disarming the Muslim population, salvaging whatever documents could be found pertaining to the exile and expropriation of Ainta Parmenians and bringing to justice those former CUP members who had participated in those activities. In late January 1919, Mills started arresting the masterminds of the Armenian deportation. Besim Bey, an accountant, Hakkı Bey, clerk of religious foundations, Injozade, a butcher, the Kurt Haji Ali Bey, and several more were summoned to Central Turkey College, the American college, where they were taken into custody and charged with the following, vandalizing Armenian houses while they were sent away, of committing murder, and of prospering from Armenian wealth, unquote. The trial was to be held in Aleppo, which the group reached on January 23, 1919, in late February, Mills ordered the disarmament of the population of Antep. Even so, the dragnet continued. On March 2nd, 1919, those charred were exiled to Egypt. The most urgent task of the British occupation forces was to facilitate the return to their homes of those Antep Armenians who had managed to survive the genocide, to restore their properties and assets, and to find the women and children now dispersed among Muslim households and return them to their families. So the exact number of Ainta Parmenians so sorry, who came back to their homeland, so however is unknown, Armenian and Turkish sources give contradictory figures. 
Turkish sources record approximately 18,000 Muslims and 37,000 Armenians in Aintab in 1918 and 19, and the number of Armenians who returned with the support of the British at around 25,000. Calculations based on Armenian sources suggest that 18,000 Armenian survivors managed to return to Aintab by the end of, end of the year. So by July 1919, the attitude of the British military authorities toward Ottoman Muslims had evolved from hostility to open friendship, a change that seems to have been reciprocated. The shift came at the expense of justice for Armenians as arrest of perpetrators slowed, along with the efforts at restoring Armenian property. The British were in fact preparing to leave Aintab. The shift, the significant change in attitude, reflected larger developments in the policy of the British Empire. To acquire oil resources in Mosul, Britain now reversed the Sky Pico Agreement in 1916 and ceded Marash, Urfa and Aintab to France in the Syrian Agreement with the French government signed on September 15, 1919. Desiring to deport Aintab without leaving behind these problems with the Muslim people, British became more lenient. For instance, Major Mill's first action after the Syrian effort was to, the end, was to end the censorship of Mustafa Kemal's telegrams and letters. The cipher telegram sent by Sabri Bey, deputy to district governor of Aintab, to the Minister of Interior on October 11, 1919, revealed that, according to the agreement reached by the British and the French, Britain would withdraw from Syria and Aintab by the end of the month. Syria would remain under French occupation. In fact, the final British brigade did not leave Aintab until November 19, 1919. Significantly, significantly before they left, they returned to Muslims the weapons they had confiscated. By 29th of October 1919, two companies of French mounted infant infantry had arrived welcomed by Armenians in the city. And there was, uh, a, there was a group of Armenian soldiers, Legion d'Orient, within this, you know, French army, French troops as well. On November 4th, 1919, Aintab was officially handed over to French troops. The fate of Armenians now, now lay in French hands, beginning at a period that all inhabitants experience as uncertain and insecure. The French military occupation proved utterly ineffective. Although some reinforcements were sent, the High Command was unable to, and it would appear unwilling to undertake adequate offensive measures against the resurgence of Turkish nationals in the city. The French failed not only to protect Armenians, but also allow them the means of protecting themselves. Even under the best, circumstance, best of circumstances, restitution in Aintab would have been a political horn's nest. The return of Aintab's Armenians led to conflict between the new arrivals and the Muslim immigrants and refugees, and relatively new, who had been settled in their houses, as well as conflict with those local officials and prominent Turks to whom Armenian houses had been rented, given, or in some cases sold by the government. Thus, return for some necessarily meant eviction for others. The issue was made worse by the fact that many of the houses, current occupants, had no place to go. In the case of Aintab, however, it was the attitude of the local Muslim authorities that was the key. These men were reluctant to restore properties to the returnees, even after the new Minister of Interior ordered the restoration. Thus, while occasionally the houses were given back when demanded by their original owners, in most cases, local authorities simply refused to evict the current occupants so that returning Armenians were, were made to suffer considerably as a result. The growing insecurity in Aintab itself was another factor that impeded the restitution. The, the city's initial tranquility, of which the CUP stalwart Eyüp Sabri Bey had once a company complained, evaporated as the return of increasing numbers of Armenians allowed local CUP networks to exploit the anxiety and anger of the townsfolk at the loss of their homes and to raise a hue and cry. So these environments and the unfortunities of the British and especially French occupation, turned the restitution process toxic despite the orders of the government in Istanbul. Aintab's townspeople responded by forming national defense organization in the city. Violence broke out when such national forces attacked returning Armenians and the homes of non-Muslims more generally again became targets for pillaging brigands. So the entire process of restoring Armenian properties was a casualty perhaps a preordained one, 
of what we can call the Turkish French war in Aintab. So which started on April 1st, 1920 and ended with the city surrendered to French military forces February 9th, 1921. According to mutual agreement set down in Ankara Treaty signed between Turkey's Grand National Assembly and the French government on October 1921, all military activities on the Turkish French port were to cease and the French withdrawal from Ainta was to speed up. Seeing the writing on the wall, Armenians had gradually begun to leave the city, beginning in March 1921, ceding their properties to so-called French protection and settling in Aleppo and Beirut, but now under a French mandate. On November 4, 1921, the French officially declared their revocation of Aintab complete, creating a great panic among those Armenians who remained and who now saw themselves delivered into the hands of Kemalist forces. In early December, 8,000 Armenians had managed to quit Aintab by their own means, even though French authorities had prohibited migration and declined to issue passports that would have allowed them to go to Syria and Lebanon. On January 1, 1922, French forbade Armenians from entering Syria, over which they now held a League of Nations mandate. In a letter full of pain to Arshak Chovanyan in Paris at the time, the deputy of the Armenian Catholic aide, Father Nerses Tavukcian, revealed the Armenian sense of abandonment, especially by the French, who had betrayed their promises to protect their lives and property. But Tavukcian's bitter reproaches were also aimed at the Armenians, including himself, for their naive naivety in believing the promises of the French civil and military authorities when in fact he said, quote, the French sacrificed Armenians to the enemy, the Kemalists. So in November 1922, the Kemalist government declared that the goods of any Armenian who failed to return to Turkey within three months would be seized. Meanwhile, it also announced that it will not recognize the validity of passports that had been issued earlier by the French authorities to the Armenians for the purposes of crossing over Syria. Rather, all Armenians of Anatolian descent were to be counted as Ottoman citizens. Apparently, by not voiding Armenians' Turkish citizenship, the new republic could more easily confiscate their properties. The Armenians did not take the bait. When, under the terms of Angara Agreement, the Giligia was returned to Turkish rule, and the French contingents left on January 1922, and the Armenians left the region too. They settled mainly in Syria and Lebanon, and a year later, January 4th, 1923, the Armenian population on Ainta numbered 80 persons. So during these turbulent years, some Armenians had been able to sell their properties, though such people were a few, were few in number. Despite the fact that sales had been made under compulsion, and for prices considerably lower than their real value, the fact that technically they had been purchased gave a color of legality to the transactions. As for the properties that had been briefly restored to Armenians, which they now had to leave behind, these were henceforth listed under the rubric of abundant properties, according to the abundant properties law. As such, they were now the government's and the local administration's disposal. So it's important to note that certain individuals, especially those who had participated in the, the Turkish-French war uh, and were the commanders on variety of fronts, were appointed after the foundation of the Turkish Republic to vital positions in the official agencies of the state. Most of the immovable army property ended up in the hands of these men, as well as with the local gentry and other war veterans of 1920-21. These men had bought the abundant properties through National Estate Agency and Deftar Darlik International Revenue Office, which had put them up for sale at a very competitive prices. Local notables colluded to hold down the price in order to buy the properties at cut rates. For instance, the buildings of Atenagan Seminary School and the Catholic Church, as you have seen in the, in, 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 in the screen, passed on to the national estate after Armenians had to vacate the city. So later these buildings were turned into Velic, Iplik and Dokuma, thread and weaving factory, and given to Jamil Alevli, a young native of Aintab, by the special order of Mustafa Kemal, as part of the effort to create a class of, class of entrepreneurs and capitalists in the city. So here we go, Jamil Alevli. 
with the Western education as his social capital and with the Mustafa Kemal acting his venture capitalist, Cemil Alevli became the biggest textile supplier for the Aintam in the Turkish Republic. He admitted that he had learned the textile business from Aintam Armenians. Since my childhood, Alevli said, I used to watch how Armenians in my neighborhood work on their textile looms for hours and hours as I headed back and forth to the school. I was amazed to follow how our main viewers created beautiful fabrics by combining various tones of red, yellow, green, blue, and white thread cones." Unquote. The abundant properties were also transformed into schools, government offices, and prisons to meet the needs of the state agencies. The Aintab Municipal Authority used them for the Central Bank, Agricultural Bank, Post Office Building, and Real Estate Credit Bank. The Armenian Apostolic Church the Armenian Apostolic Church, in a particularly repellent twist, became a prison in the Republican era, although in 1988 it was converted to a mosque and lay Liberation Mosque. One of the large commercial buildings known as the Millet Hane, as you have seen in the, in the screen, founded by the Armenian community in 1868 and 69, to benefit Armenian school and part of the estate of uh, Surp Asfazetsin Yegretsi was sold by the treasury and to third parties. In a book sponsored and published by Aintab's governorship in 2005, Gaziantep Kültür Envanteri, Gaziantep Cultural Inventory, this inn was designated a Turkish cultural asset in the book. The inn known as Kürtçühane, founded by Hanna Kürtçüyen in 1890, was sold to Mustafa Humanızlı. Actually, I went to high school with great-granddaughter of this, this, this guy. So, so it was sold by the treasury. Similar in status to Millet Inn, the Kürt Kürtçü Han, Kürtçü Inn is another Armenian building that acquired the honor of being named a Turkish cultural asset. Finally, some of the houses that belonged to Armenians were used in 1921-22 for charitable purposes, distributed at no charge to Muslim families who had lost their own dwellings during the Turkish French War. This is exactly what the Nazis did during the Holocaust, you know, and the properties of the uh, uh, of the of the of the Jews, especially I'm talking about the German, I mean the uh, the Third Reich at that period, uh, Germans whose houses were bombed. You know, as a, over the course of war, they, the properties of the, of the Jews were bestowed and given to them. This was the fate in 1922 of the house owned by the father of Harutun Nazarian, who was forced to live in, to live Aintab and settle in Aleppo along with the rest of his family when he was 15. In a memoir, Nazarian recalled the event as follows. Before we left the house, a state official accompanied by two women came into our yard early in the morning. Then the official said, as you are leaving Aintab, and the houses of these two women were demolished due to the battle and bombardments, and in addition to that, since the state and local government have authorized you to leave Aintab, your house along with other empty houses will be occupied by others. He also asked these two women how many rooms there were in their racket houses. In this manner, house was registered into the list of other occupied houses." Unquote. So several years after, abandoned houses and estates of the Armenians were still being used to settle immigrants and refugees. Through personal directives of Mustafa Kemal, Armenian land assets were sometimes also bestowed on individuals as reward for noteworthy accomplishments during the national struggle. For instance, through Benzade Ahmed Efendi, a parliamentary deputy of Aleppo who hailed from a family of Antioch notables and has resided in Gaziantep ever since the Middle East national boundaries, redrawn after the war, had left Aleppo, outside the new Turkish nation state, was such a beneficiary. It was Mustafa Kemal himself who gave instructions on December 14, 1924, that Turkmenzade Ahmed Efendi, whose previous house in Antioch was worth 30,000 liras, had been confiscated by the French. He was to be, to be awarded a sizable garden and courtyards from abundant properties turned national assets of equal value due to his outstanding services during the national struggle. The order was approved by the degree of ministerial cabinet and implemented on December 1924. 
So abundant properties were also used to meet the needs deemed essential to the people. In an enactment, enactment date, November 3rd, 1926, it was decreed that an estate that had once belonged to a local Armenian located in Chukurbostan neighborhood in Gaziantep was to be allocated to the municipality for the purposes of building a bakery and for a sum to be assessed. And immovable properties of the Armenians were also given to Muslim immigrants who had been settled in Ainta. For example, when an immigrant from Adil Jawas district in Bitlis province applied to the administration for the settlement of Gaziantep province or the re relocation to the city, his request was referred to the Minister of Interior. In the minister's March 1927 response to Gaziantep administration, it was stated that the settlement of Abdullah, the son of Haji Reshid, in Gaziantep posed no problem, and that a house from the remaining abandoned Armenian properties of Aintab, Armenians, be given to him so that he and his family could live comfortably. As can be seen from this example, as late as 1927, distribution of Gaziantep Armenian, Armenian properties was still going on. So, the official Turkish historiography claimed that the Turkish-French war in Aintab was a heroic struggle, struggle for national independence, which earned the city the glory and its grand title, Gazi, the conqueror, Gaziantep's heroic epic, was in fact a struggle whose incentive was to wipe out the Armenian presence in the city for good. So, clean the environment, space itself. Its main motive was to ensure that Armenians of Aintab would never be able to return to the city. Whether forcibly removed or through various administrative measures, the outcome of all these struggles rendered it impossible for Armenian repatriates to remain in their native cities, towns or villages. Hoping to make these people flee their homeland again, the brave national warriors continued to terrorize them. When the Armenians left Ainta for good in 1921-22, their leftover houses, fields, estates and other properties were sold at bargain prices. With the new administrative and legal regulations coming into effect after Lausanne in 1924, and with other bilateral agreements between the republics of France and Turkey in 1926 and 1932 respectively, that invalidated return of properties that had belonged to Armenians throughout Giligia, all movable and immovable properties of Armenians who had been forced to leave for Aleppo and Beirut were appropriated. At the time, France was the mandatory power over Syria and Lebanon, and it was easy to imagine that the mandatory power might act as defender of the refugee Armenians whose rights had been violated. As Bahe Tarchian notes, the reality, however, was different. France wanted to establish close links with the newly created Turkish state, and it pursued a policy to that end. So more particularly, Armenian properties were offered at auctions organized at the initiative of local administration and sold especially to the members of Aintab gentry who had participated in the French-Turkish war or supported national forces financially and logistically. Otherwise, the numerous properties once owned by the Armenians of Aintab were used to house the offices of the civil service of the central government. Yet in other cases, properties were handed out free of charge on the orders of central government and Mustafa Kemal. Thus, the rich and wealthy Turkish Muslim class whose foundations were laid in Aintab during the period between 1915 and 1918, was able, in the weeks between December 1921 and January 1922, when the exile, the complete departure of Aintab Armenians was made irreversible to consolidate its status. Until mid-1940s, the influence of Muslim elites over the city continued. The mayors of the city for the years 1921-1950 all derived from the same influential families. These elites entirely dominated the industry and economy of Gaziantep in late 1930s and 40s. Most of these men, moreover, were members of the Republican People's Party and representatives of the party branch in Ainta. Our main assets, such as shops, estates, houses in the neighbors of Kozanlı, Ibrahimli, Körkin, Eblahan, Büyük Kızılhisar, Akyol, Eyboğlu, began to be sold at the rigged auctions to the members of those prominent families for very low prices in post-genocide Turkey. This real estate was auctioned by dealers associated with the Aintab Revenue Office. Auctions were preceded by newspaper announcements about the details of the sales in question, 
listing the approximate location, type and value in liras of the properties in question, and most important, their previous owners, but with no reference to the state that had acquired the properties and now constitute their current owner. So we were not able to see the current owner of, the, of those properties in question in this uh, newspaper announcement. To sum up, the new reach of Aintab were not influential figures in the national resistance, not only in the Republican period, but also emerged as the new captains of the industry in the city and the economic elite of Aintab was being reconstituted along political lines. A new political class based on such qualifications as previous CUP service, zeal in the French Turkish war, and political reliability as Republicans was able, through its acquisition of our main wealth, to lay the economic foundations that will sustain its status over the generations long after the World War I and its aftermath were only a memory. Thank you so much for your patience.